Hi, welcome to Constitutional Chats, hosted by me, Janine Turner, and Kathy Gillespie, with students, Dakari Chapman, and me, Tova Kaplan. Join us as we discuss hot topic issues with constitutional experts. It's sponsored by Constituting America. Constitutional Chats. I am founder and co-president of Constituting America, and I'm an actress by trade. You can check all that out at JanineTurner.com, but I'm the founder and co-president of Constituting America, and we're thrilled that you're with us today. Today, we're going to be discussing the 14th Amendment, Equal Protection, Citizenship Rights, and You. And one of our peak questions is, can the government make you wear a mask? Will we have the answer for that? We don't know. Um, all righty, and as I said, our special guest for our constitutional hot topic today is Georgetown Center for the Constitution, Professor Randy Barnett. Kathy Gillespie, co-president of Constituting America, the extraordinary Kathy Gillespie. We are the, the two wings of the eagle, but we would not be off the ground without you, our donors and sponsors. You're the wind beneath our wings. Kathy, say hello. Hi, everybody, and we especially want to thank our sponsor for this episode, Mr. and Mrs. David Finstermaker, David and Danae Finstermaker, who are making this possible, and the Finstermakers have been longtime supporters of Constituting America and just do a great job helping us in so many ways, making introductions, giving advice, and uh, we thank you, David and Danae, for sponsoring this episode of our Constitutional Chats. Yes, thank you so, 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 so much. You're the wind beneath our wings. Okay, we have Tova Love Kaplan with us today, who's a three-time winner of our We the Future contest. She's the National Youth Director of Constituting America. Someday you're going to see her as Secretary of the State or President, whatever she chooses to do, perhaps the head of the UN. Um, Tova Love Kaplan, say hello. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm so happy that there's a lot of kids and elementary schoolers, high schoolers, middle schoolers, parents of children tuning in. And even if you're not, we're so glad to have you. Um, so welcome everyone. Hope you enjoy the show. Okay, Dakari Chapman is with us, I think, um, in voice only. Dakari Chapman is equally as exceptional. 18 year old student, well now he's almost graduating from North Carolina. He is Constituting America's student ambassador. He has won our contest two times. And he is just fabulous, fabulous, wonderful. Dakar is a working actor, can be seen on season two very soon of Netflix's this hit series, Outer Banks. And someday he'll be clutching a bevy of Tonys and Academy Awards and, and whatnot. So Dakari Chapman, say hello. Hi, everyone. We're so glad that you're here and um, hope everyone's doing well and hope you enjoy this chat today. Um, Randy Barnett, I'm gonna tell you about Mr. Professor Barnett today. Professor Barnett's publications, well, let me just go back. He is um, the Patrick, I don't know how you say this. Hotel. Hotel. Professor, there you go. Professor of Constitution Law at the at Georgetown University Law Center, where he directs the Georgetown Center for the Constitution. And Professor Barnett's publications include 11 books, more than 100 articles and reviews, as well as numerous op-eds. His most recent book, which we have and we have read, and it is amazing, I run, don't walk and get it, An Introduction to the Constitutional Law, 100 Supreme Court Cases Everyone Should Know. He has argued cases before the Supreme Court and has appeared in numerous documentaries, including PBS's Constitution USA with Peter Segal and a more or less perfect union with Judge Douglas Ginsburg. And he portrayed a prosecutor in the 2010 science fiction feature film Inalienable the Movie. Well, that sounds really cool. He blogs on the Volok Conspiracy. Welcome, Professor Barnett. We are thrilled to have you with us today. You also have a book soon to be released on the 14th Amendment, do you not? Well, not exactly soon. It was turned in last week to the Harvard University Press who's publishing it. So it'll be soon to be published in November of this year. So not exactly soon, but pretty soon by academic press standards. Yeah, no kidding. It just everything takes so long. All right, Professor Barnett, welcome. All right, well, the first thing I wanna say is that everything that I'm saying today 
uh, is explained at greater length in my book, An Introduction to Constitutional Law, 100 Supreme Court Cases Everyone Should Know. And that book comes with a scratch off code good for a 65 video series that my co-author Josh Blackman and I spent two years to make in which you can see all of these ideas illustrated um, uh, graphically with recordings and pictures. Um, and so if you're interested in what I have to say in the next five minutes, you can get a lot more uh, that's made accessible to the audience that are actually on this podcast today um, uh, via the book, uh, which is available on amazon.com and all, all, all online booksellers. So the first thing most people do not realize um, is that most of the constraints on state governments come from one particular amendment. It's called the 14th Amendment. The 14th Amendment was adopted in 1868. Um, it was proposed by Republicans in the wake of the Civil War um, as a means of combating um, uh, a terrorist activity and discriminatory activity that was being perpetrated against free African-American slaves, uh, former slaves. Um, and the 13th Amendment had been passed to free them, and yet they were subjected to all kinds of abuses by their own state governments. Well, the United States Constitution originally did not provide many limits on the powers of the states, and in particular, what's called the police power of the states, a term that is not in the Constitution itself, but it is a recognized term to describe what is the legislative power of states. Um, that police power is very broad, and until the 14th Amendment, as I say, there were very few constraints on it. So if you ever see a constitutional challenge to a state law as opposed to a federal law, chances are it's a 14th Amendment challenge, even though it might be called a First Amendment challenge, or it might be called a Second Amendment challenge. Um, it is those amendments read through the 14th Amendment, because there were, before there was the 14th Amendment, the First Amendment didn't apply to the states, the Second Amendment didn't apply to the states, then neither did the Fourth, Fifth, Sixth, Seventh, and Eighth Amendments did not apply to the states. Um, so what does the 14th Amendment say? I, one other thing I want to say before I get to that. When you ask or you consider whether something is constitutional or is not constitutional, there are really two different ways of answering that question. There is, well, what does the Constitution say? What is the meaning of the text of the Constitution and what does it tell us about what you're asking? That's one good way of understanding what's constitutional. But the other way, which in fact is probably more common, is to say, what will the Supreme Court do about this? What, would the, what will the judges do? Uh, to answer that question, you have to look not at the Constitution itself, but at constitutional law. What my book is about, constitutional law. That is the rulings courts have made over the last 230, 240 years, and with respect to the 14th Amendment, the rulings that the courts have made since 1868. Now, that's the first lesson. I mean, first lesson is constraints on states come from the 14th Amendment by and large, not from any other part of the Constitution. Secondly, there's two ways of looking at constitutionality. What does the Constitution say, properly interpreted? And secondly, what do the courts say? And then the third thing to realize, once you have that, is that for at least the last 140 years, the courts have not actually adhered to the full original meaning of the 14th Amendment. They have deviated from it. They have under-enforced the meaning of the 14th Amendment. In some rare cases, they may have over-enforced it. They may have forced it and made it, used it in ways it shouldn't have been used. Mostly they neglect it. Um, and so we have to keep it straight, what we're talking about. We're talking about what the courts will do, which is usually less than what the 14th Amendment actually provides. With that as background, let me now read to you what the 14th Amendment says, because these are the operative provisions. There are four operative provisions in section one of the 14th Amendment. The first is the citizenship clause, which I'm not going to talk about at this point, which, may, which recognizes uh, anyone born in the United States and subject to its jurisdiction, citizen of the United States. Um, that was very important because um, Dred Scott, the, the, the Supreme Court ruling in Dred Scott had denied that African-Americans who were either slaves or even freedmen who had private, previously been slaves could ever be citizens of the United States. And so the 14th Amendment settles the fact that they could be for, citizens of the United States. A constitutional amendment was required to reverse a Supreme Court case. In this case, it was Dred Scott. But now we're concerned for the rest of this discussion in the next three provisions of the 14th Amendment. And these have these go by three different, there's three names, one name for each of these. I'll tell you what the names are, then I'll read you what they say. 
The first is the privileges or immunities clause. The second is the due process of law clause. And the third is the equal protection of the laws clause. And those are sometimes referred to in a shorthand as the due process clause or the equal protection clause. I like to use all the words because all the words actually make a difference in what they mean. So what do we have? The privileges or immunities clause, the due process of law clause, and the equal protection clause. Those are all in section one of the 14th amendment. What do those clauses say? The privilege or immunities clause says the following, no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States. Let me come back to that one. Secondly, nor shall the due process of law clause says, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. And then finally is the equal protection of the laws clause, which says, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. Those are your three operative clauses of the 14th Amendment. So the first thing you need to know, and it's rather shocking, is that the first of those clauses, the Privileges or Immunities Clause, has been completely disregarded by the Supreme Court with two exceptions since its adoption in 1868. Beginning in 1873, in a case called the Slaughterhouse Cases, the Supreme Court essentially said that clause it has a meaning, but its meaning is generally irrelevant to anything that we would be interested in talking about. And from 1873 until this day, that clause has never been used by a majority of the Supreme Court to invalidate any law. Now, that should become as a big surprise to you, because if you came down from another planet and someone told you that the Constitution of this country said that no state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, you'd think that was pretty darn important, wouldn't you? And then if I told you that the Supreme Court has refused to enforce that provision ever since it was adopted, at least since 1873, I think you'd be pretty surprised. All right. So what's happened since 1873 and today is that the other two clauses that I read to you have been expanded beyond their original meaning to make up for the slack and the gap that was caused by getting rid of the privilege or immunities clause. It's as though if you had a tooth pulled the other teeth in your mouth would then maybe slide over and occupy the space that was being that was being fulfilled by the tooth that's been removed. So they removed the privilege immunities clause, and then over a course of decades, over a hundred years, the due process of law clause got expanded to cover some of what the privilege immunities clause covers, but not all of it, and the equal protection clause got expanded to cover some of what the privilege immunities clause said, but not all of it. So now with that in mind, let me give you a super brief summary of what I think these three clauses mean. What do they actually mean? And then we can go to questions and discussion from there. So the Privileged Immunities Clause is what you might call a fundamental rights clause. It says the people have certain fundamental rights. In fact, it says the citizens, this is citizenship clause. The other two clauses are about all people. The Privileged Immunities Clause is just about citizens. That citizens, have certain fundamental rights that attach to them as citizens and as persons, and that states may not violate those fundamental rights. That's pretty simple, I think. Now, it doesn't tell you what the fundamental rights are, but it tells it, it's an affirmation that these fundamental rights, known as privileges or immunities, um, may not be violated or abridged, in the words of the stat of the of the Constitution, by a state. That's the privilege immunity clause. Call it the fundamental rights clause. The due process of law clause is about applying the law to particular persons by means, and what it says is every person is entitled to a judicial process before they may be deprived justly of their life, their liberty, or their property. If you're going to be sentenced to death in a capital case, you're going to be deprived of your life. If you're going to be sent to prison, you're going to be deprived of your liberty. If you are fined, or subject to a civil judgment, you're gonna be deprived of your property, but none of that is supposed to happen to you as a person unless you have a judicial process that says that that deprivation is within the law. That deprivation is the due process. That's why I say the due process of law clause because it tells you that the due process of law is about a judicial assessment that a, any deprivation of life, liberty, or property is within the law. 
Okay, that's a shorthand for that. And the law, by the way, includes statutes, but it also, it makes that statutes must be consistent with the constitution. It must be consistent, those statutes must be consistent with the privilege or immunities clause. So you need, a, you, you are entitled to a judicial process before to, sh to challenge whether a law really has violated the privilege or immunities clause, because otherwise it's not a law and you would not be deprived of your life, liberty, or property by means of a valid law. Finally, the Equal Protection Clause, what's that about? It is not exclusively, but it's primarily the Equal Enforcement Clause. It says that no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property, uh, I'm sorry, nor shall any person be depri uh, uh, deprived of the equal protection of the laws. And this is about protection. It was primarily aimed at the fact that Southern governments were not protecting the freedmen from violence, both violence from government agents and also violence from private parties. And so this said that the state governments had a constitutional duty to provide each and every one of us protection, either both from the government and from our fellow citizens. And if they fail in that duty, that's a violation of the Equal Protection Clause that can be remedied for example, by Congress passing a civil rights law to protect our rights in a way that states refuse to do. And that's something Republicans did shortly after adopting the 14th Amendment. They passed the Civil Rights Act of 1875 and a number of other civil rights acts, many of which got declared unconstitutional wrongly by the Supreme Court as they constricted the meaning of the 14th Amendment to invalidate those early civil rights laws. And it wasn't until over 100 years later when the Civil Rights Act of, 18, of 1964 was enacted, um, which started to protect our constitutional rights, um, although there was an earlier Civil Rights uh, Act as well in the, in the 1950s. And it was only with these later constitutional, uh, these later statutes that the 14th Amendment started to be enforced. Anyway, that's a I know I've gone on for a long time. As you can imagine, this is a very complicated subject, which is why I recommended that if you're interested in this, you pick up the book and get a user-friendly version of this uh, in video form. But in the meantime, I'm happy to discuss any further uh, questions you guys have. Well, thank you, Professor Barnett. That's very stimulating. <laughs> I have so many notes. Like, was it too much? Was, wanna... was it too much, Janine? Too much? No, no, no. No, it's not too much at all. I just have all, I have all these notes, which you can't see. Um, but I'm not, do I wanna go down this avenue or this avenue or this avenue or this avenue? So I wanna to go to Dakar because he has to leave in just a few minutes, but I do wanna ask this question. It's interesting because there's so many, but this is, I think my primary thought. It's interesting that it says the states cannot violate our fundamental rights. Right. But what's interesting now is citizens feel that the federal government is violating our rights. So it's talking about states, but what about the federal government? Well, uh, what, we call, what we call the Bill of Rights, uh, which was not initially called the Bill of Rights, by the way, but what we call the Bill of Rights is the first eight, eight amendments or eight, the first 10 amendments of the Constitution. They all apply to the federal government. They've always applied to the federal government. Uh, so the federal government's constrained by the First Amendment, the Second Amendment, the Fourth Amendment, the Fifth Amendment, that already exists. And the Fifth Amendment contains its own due process of law clause. And it's, it's also, the, in other words, it was copied from the Fifth Amendment into the 14th Amendment. And so the Fifth Amendment has that same requirement of a judicial process before anyone can be deprived of their life, liberty, or property that the 14th Amendment then says states must also provide. Great, okay, great, got it, now I'm clear. Okay, Dakari, go ahead. Hi, um, thank you for that information. Um, just as a general, could you tell us how the 14th Amendment pertains to COVID-19 and, and mask mandates? Well, I knew that question was coming because we talked, we talked I was given a, a heads up that it was coming. Um, and I can only address this in, in general terms. Um, and the general terms are these. Um, under, and I'm, remember, there's two ways of anal analyzing any constitutional question under the original meaning of the text or under current case law. Um, and I'm going to deal with it, I think, primarily under current case law. Uh, but let me just back up and talk about conceptually. Remember, I said the states have a police power. Um, that's something that they've had since the founding and, so, and they continue to have. Now, they cannot exercise that police power in a way that violates the 14th Amendment, but they have a police power. And what is at the core of the police power is the power of the states to protect the health and safety of their people. 
Now, it's obvious in the case of criminal law, protecting against murder, rape, armed robbery, um, and other crimes. I used to be a criminal prosecutor in Chicago. I used to enforce those laws. Um, it's obvious that that's a valid exercise of the state's police power. There's another aspect of the state's police power, which is the regulation. That, that's, what is that? Those actions, all those prohibit wrongful activity. They prohibit the activity that violates the rights of your fellow citizen. That's what those laws do. But the police power goes beyond prohibiting wrongful activity. It also includes regulating the exercise of rightful activity. So that when you act rightfully, when it's not, you're not acting wrongfully, you're not murdering anybody or killing anybody or stealing from them. But when you go about your business using your own property, uh, yourself and your own property, that you don't do harm to other people and, you re and it's re you're regulated in a way to prevent that from happening. So think about building code, uh, uh, for example, that say how buildings should be built to prevent um, the collapse of the building, to prevent, they have a hand, let's say you have a, a, a railing, a guard railing on your balcony. It has to be a certain height so people won't fall off of it. Uh, it's true that after the fact, if you build a building negligently, you could be sued in negligence, but a building code prevents the bad conduct from happening, the risky conduct from happening by giving you a regulation of your rightful activity. You have a right to build a building, you have a right to live in a building, but it's got to be done a certain way to protect the rights of others. That's the police power. So when COVID comes in, the obvious issue is, is it a health or safety measure? Does, does COVID threaten the public health? I think the answer is it does. Communicable, communicable diseases were well known to the founders, um, well known to the authors of the 14th Amendment. They were pervasive in this country, um, way more pervasive than they are now. Um, how, what to do about them wasn't also always so clear. Um, and in fact, it isn't so clear even today. But Communicable, the ability of government to combat communicable diseases is clearly within the health and safety powers they have. Now having said, so there you go. Now having said that though, what do you do about any particular law or regulation? And in most of these cases in COVID, these are orders by governors. These aren't even laws passed by state legislatures. Assuming that the governor is empowered to make these, uh, these dictates, these commands, which they may not be. But assuming that's a separation of powers question within state government, but assuming these governors act, actually have the authority given to them by their legislatures to do what they're doing. What about that? Well, I think that my own view is, and this is my view, and some courts have agreed with me and some courts have not. My own view is the due process of law says that before you can be deprived of your liberty, you're entitled to a judicial process to ensure that the order that is being imposed upon you is lawful. It's a lawful order. And to be a lawful order, in my view, now this is my view, and again, some, a few courts have agreed with me and several courts have not, in order to be lawful, it must be a fact-based assessment that this is a means that is necessary to the end of protecting against a communicable disease. So you are entitled as an individual person under the due process clause to go into court and say, I am being subjected to a restriction that is not fact-based. It is not adequately supported by any evidence of effectiveness, et cetera. And then a neutral judge under the due process of law should pass upon the sufficiency of the evidence that the government offers on behalf of its restriction of your liberty. So that's the reason why I can't answer this question specifically, because to answer this question, I would need to know a lot about the evidence that was available to support a mask mandate or any other mandate, a six foot distance rule, you know, social distancing rule, um, the uh, a fact that a restaurant can only be open to 25% capacity or not. Uh, I can, I, I'll, I'm going to add one other twist to this. I can imagine that in the early days of a pandemic, when not that much is known about a disease, governments may act in a certain way without that much evidence because the evidence doesn't exist. But as time goes by, and, it, and then what they do would be constitutional, at least in the short term. But the constitutionality would change as the evidence becomes available. And it becomes apparent, or doesn't become apparent, that these restrictions on liberty are not fact-based. They are not evidence-based. They are based on fiat, will, prejudice, ma, you know, mass thinking of various kinds, political correctness, whatever you want to call it. Um, they're not evidence-based. 
Uh, so that's my answer to your question. Is this, it's a, it, when it comes to state laws as opposed to federal laws, it's a 14th Amendment question. I believe it's a due process of law question um, uh, as to whether these are fact-based restrictions on liberty, evidence-based restrictions on liberty. And I don't know the answer to that question because I'm a lawyer and I'm not a doctor, if I, or I'm not a scientist. If I was litigating this case, like all lawyers do, I would have to become familiar with the evidence that I'm presenting, as the government would have to become familiar with the evidence it's presenting. And we present the evidence that we have to a neutral judge, which is what the due process of law requires, is a neutral judge decides between a member of the public, me and my lawyer, and the government and its lawyer. We need a neutral tribunal of justice. I'm going to teach constitutional law, separation of powers, uh, federalism tonight, my first class for the spring semesters tonight. And we're going to start talking about separation of powers and the need for judicial review. That's what the judicial, that's what the due process of law requires. Um, and then it's in the course of that process, judges will tend to give the benefit of the doubt to the legislature. You may or may not like that idea. But giving the benefit of the doubt to them should not be the same thing as giving them a carte blanche to do whatever they want for whatever reason, period. They ought to be able, if what they're doing is reasonable, they ought to be able to come in and explain why it's reasonable and what evidence they're relying on to make their judgment. Okay. Um, Professor Burnett, um, once again, that was fascinating. I want to just step in and, and kind of unpack that a little bit, and then I'm going to go to Tova. Um, gosh. My as a twofold question. My first question is that you're talking primarily about the states, and it's the 14th Amendment. The states, it's a, up to the states to what they what they do. Um, I'm also thinking about the judges and how many of them aren't really neutral anymore because they're political. So how do you really get a neutral judge? Um, but you're talking about the states. And my, I have two questions. My first is, and then I'll, I'll throw the two questions out and let you you come back. The, the first is, I haven't seen. And some people have been so upset saying California and New York about their restaurants being closed. But have they made it to the courts uh, on a state level? I don't know that I've seen anything uh, be taken to the courts uh, or to the state legislatures. And the, the second thing is, um, you're talking about what the states can do in regard to this mandate, which of course has to have the science and everything you're telling us about and you know go through the court system. But I haven't seen anything. I, I don't know that these people in California and New York are actually going to the, to the courts. The second thing is federally, I know that everyone wants President Biden to pass a federal mandate for masks. So where does the federal government step into this of what they can and cannot tell you to do? Because you're, you're, you seem to be implying it's surely, it should be restricted to the states. And that's what President Trump left it to the states. But now I, Biden's already signed a few things here and there that he's trying, there are certain mandates that the federal government's already doing. So how do you feel about that? So those are my two questions. It seems as though what the Biden administration is talking about is regulating or requiring masks on federal property, um, which the federal government controls. In fact, I think there was some brouhaha about the fact that they issued such an executive order and they didn't follow it themselves. They took pictures of themselves without a mask on federal property. Um, and all, also they're empowered to regulate interstate commerce. Uh, their, Congress has an enumerated power to regulate commerce among the several states. So for example, that would seem to give them jurisdiction over, for example, airlines or railroads, whether you're, you know, when you fly on an airplane, there could be a federal rule uh, about whether you wear a mask on an airplane or in a train that goes from one state to another. Um, I don't know that the Biden administration has claimed any more power than that. I think if they did, they would be in trouble, even under the current legal system, even under our current under enforcement of the constitutional limits that we have today. Um, but I don't think that's what they've tried to do so far. Okay, so that, that's the federal, the federal question. And I'm just trying to correlate that to, um, to rights within the 14th Amendment, because if we have these inherent rights, but of course, in, uh, well, well, the inherent rights, I guess, would be, be in our Bill of Rights. Does that mean we only have those inherent rights in our states? The federal government can take those rights away from us if the federal government wants to? All right, so let me uh, back up here for a minute and talk about the difference between the federal government and the state government. I mentioned the state governments have what's called a police power. The police power is a general power to protect the health and safety and welfare of the people. The federal government, Congress, doesn't have a police power like that. The federal government has a list of a special and enumerated powers that are listed in Article I, Section 8. 
And they include lots of things, the power to raise and support armies, the power to establish a post office, the power to issue money, uh, to coin money, um, uh, the power to establish a District of Columbia and regulate the District of Columbia, et cetera. One of the powers that the federal government has is the power to regulate commerce among the several states. It's called the commerce power. Um, and so what the Congress has to do, it can't say, oh, we have a, if, it can't just say everybody needs to do this because it's about, it's about health because they don't have that power. It's the states that have that power under our system. They have to say, we're exercising one of our enumerated powers. And the most obvious power to be exercising here is the commerce power, which is what I think they have done. And so one of the, the first line of protection that we're supposed to have in our constitution is that Congress is only supposed to be exercising one of its enumerated powers. Before you ever get to rights, the first way of protecting our rights is to limit the power of the federal government. Now, as I told you at the founding, the powers of states were not limited very much. As a result, slavery was upheld. Slavery continued. The most egregious violation of individual rights you can imagine is being held as a chattel slave. That was constitutional under the original constitution because the states had that much power. That's what the 13th and 14th amendments changed. It took away that power of the states to violate the fundamental rights of their own people. That's why the 14th Amendment is important. Uh, but the states still have okay. the states still have a general health and safety power to protect health and safety that the federal government does not have. Right, right, right. Okay. Well, we could we could, I could ask a thousand uh, Montessori type follow up questions right. because it's interesting because if they can tell you what to do on an airplane, they could probably tell you tell you not you can't speak freely on an airplane or you know it, it, it's interesting how they they can regulate on federal lands or federal commerce they can tell you what to do federal, federal powers are also constrained by the bill of rights so first it has to be enumerated power and the enumerated powers are constrained by the first amendment the second amendment and all that stuff mm -hmm. okay good 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 okay go ahead tova Great, thank you so much. This has been so fascinating and congratulations on your upcoming book. We're so lucky to nab the best expert in the field for our topic right before you publish your book. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk a little more about the slaughterhouse case that you mentioned and you know, how can the Supreme Court just refuse to enforce a certain aspect of the constitution and if they have that power, you know, how, how can our republic function as a constitutional republic? Could you talk a little bit about that? Well, it functions less well than it should, uh, because as, Matt, as Alexander Hamilton explained in Federalist 78, which is what I'm, my students are reading for tonight's class, um, there is a judicial power there to hold government to its, within its limits. It says the judicial power is much more necessary when you have limited government than when you don't have limited government, because someone's got to hold the government to its limits, and it's got to be an independent judiciary, which justifies lifetime appointment, removal only, uh, for good cause, you know, using impeachment, etc. Um, so the answer is, if the courts fall down on their job, we are going. We're not going to have as much of a constitutional republic as we're entitled to. Uh, the first sentence of my book, uh, uh, the Restoring the Lost Constitution, said that if courts had been doing their job, this book would not need to be written. The courts have not been doing their job, and but sometimes when they are doing their job in invalidating laws conservatives complain that they're interfering with the popular uh, elected officials. Um, and so you get complaints from either side when their favorite law is struck down and they accuse the courts of being engaged in what's called judicial activism, interfering with the popular branches. Um, and that's what the debate turns into. But I think you're right. Uh, courts should not be able to, should have to do their duty, but over the history of our country, the courts have shirked their duty. And so if um, the courts had upheld the first clause, would there have been a need for the 15th and 19th amendments um, allowing black people and women the rights to vote? It, or would that have been covered under the 14th? That's such a great question. And, and I just love that question so much. Um, no, it would not have been included in the 14th amendment because voting rights at that time were considered what's called a political right, not a civil right. And so what the 14th Amendment protected were civil rights. Now, voting rights eventually became a civil right, and they became a civil right. They crossed over from being a political right to being a civil right. And what made them the civil right was the 15th Amendment um, and the 19th Amendment. Uh, that's, what, that's when they became civil right, a civil right. And now they are a privilege or immunity of citizenship, but they weren't 
uh, when the 14th Amendment was enacted, and they wouldn't have been without a subsequent enactment of that kind. Um, so great question. Those amendments were necessary. Great. And then that kind of answers my other question. Um, so why is there the, I, the law or the idea that only people who are born in the U.S. can serve as president, even though with the 14th Amendment, you know, with the, that clause about um, being entitled to the same rights, is that the same reason why? Because it's not considered a civil right. It's considered a different right, being able to serve yes. as president. Yeah, the right to run for office was not a civil right. Um, the right to run for office was a privilege uh, that some people could have and other people could not have. Uh, that was very, very clear. Um, civil rights are the rights we get from government to protect what's called our natural rights, the rights we have in a state of nature, the rights to do what we will with what belongs to us. But we leave the state of nature to get a better protection of our natural rights than we can do on our own. Government is supposed to protect us. So we, in a sense, we swap our natural rights for a civil right to, of protection, which is what the Equal Protection Clause is talking about. We get this civil right of protection of our natural rights. Um, and it protects things that are necessary to protect natural rights as well. Uh, but that doesn't include participating in whatever political system that may or may not exist. That is more of a selection process. And think of it today. Uh, minors can't vote. Fel convicted felons serving in uh, pr prison terms, they can't vote. Um, so even today, we do restrict the political franchise. We just don't restrict it as much as we used to, thanks to the 15th and the 19th Amendments, as well as the Constitutional Amendment, which lowered the voting age from 21 to 18, the 26th Amendment, I think. I'm guessing here. Thanks. Great. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Thank you. Um, and OK, I'm not an expert on the judicial system. You are much more than I am. But I was wondering about the system of bail, um, talking in the context of the due process before they deprive you of um, your liberty or property. Um, when you, you know, I don't, I, mean, I don't know much about it, but I believe it's, uh, if you are accused of a crime, they can keep you in jail until you um, pass cash bail and give over, is that considered like being forced to give over property to the government without due process or is that not the there is a process. There is a process before a uh, bail is set. It's a judicial process. It's called you have a bail hearing, um, and before a judge. It, it's not that the police keep you in jail because of bail until you post bail. You have to be brought before a magistrate within a, a very short period of time and given a bail hearing. And then a member of the independent judiciary provides you with a judicial process by which bail is assessed. And the theory behind bail is that some people are flight risks and are not going to show up for their court date. Uh, and so bail is supposed to make them show up, for, show up for their court date or they'll forfeit their bail. And in the days when there were private bail bondsmen, the bail bondsmen would actually go out and catch the people and bring them to court because otherwise the bail bondsmen would lose the bond. But we don't have private bail bondsmen as much now, except there's some TV shows like Sneaky Pete and some others that are about bail bondsmen. But uh, it's, it's somewhat of a dying practice and was, it has its abuses as well as advantages. Right. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, and you mentioned something about the 1866 Civil Rights Act. I've never really heard about that. Could you go more into that? I don't think I mentioned it, but I, <laughs> I, but I, but I it is a very important act. <laughs> so I'm glad you mentioned it. Um, it was called the Civil Rights Act of 1866. It was devised by Congress during the same session that the same Congress that wrote the 14th Amendment had a parallel initiative to provide the civil rights law. And the civil rights prote that protected in the Civil Rights Act of 1866 protected the right to make and enforce contracts, to sue and be sued, to own, uh, possess property, to personal security that's, uh, that's available for the protection of one's rights. It was done as a statute and it was pursuant to Congress's power under the 13th Amendment that abolished slavery. There's section two of the 13th Amendment empowers Congress to enforce the 13th Amendment and Congress passed the Civil Rights Act as saying, we're enforcing the 13th Amendment. It's the freedmen that are be their, their civil rights are being abused and we want to protect them. Well, Andrew Johnson, who was the president after Lincoln's assassination, vetoed the Civil Rights Act of 1866 on the grounds that it was beyond the power of Congress under the 13th Amendment because it wasn't about slavery at all. It was about rights. Um, well, some in Congress kind of thought Johnson might have had a point and they said, we need a constitutional amendment that's gonna do what the Civil Rights Act is doing by statute. Others said, no, no, he's wrong. But either way, we're gonna do it both ways. First of all, we're gonna override his veto and they overrode the veto and it became law. Secondly, we're gonna pass an amendment 
that makes no doubt that we have the power to pass the civil rights law. And then after they have passed the 14th Amendment, they reenacted the Civil Rights Act under the new amendment to say, for sure, we have the power to do it this time. And so one of the reasons why I love this question is the rights that are contained in the Civil Rights Act tell us what they thought privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States were at the time, because that's what they were protecting. They were protecting their the rights in the Civil Rights Act by putting them in the Constitution. That's part of what privileges or immunities means. What I think is really interesting is that you talk about this, this that the courts did not do their job. And I and we talked about this last week, but so many people think the Supreme Court's the be all and the end all. And what's fascinating about this whole situation and what we learned last week is that when the Supreme Court fails, it doesn't end there. The, the legislature can come back in, the people, the, they, can, they can create these acts like you're talking about, the, the civil rights acts and things of that nature, but they can also pass an amendment. The people can, can overturn Supreme Court decisions with amendments. And I think that that check and balance is really awesome. Last week, uh, we, our guest was talking about how the 13th, 14th, and 15th amendments overturned the Dred Scott decision and how the 16th amendment overturned Pollock versus Farmers Loan Trust of 1895, which struck down federal income tax. So I just think it's really great to remind everybody that if the courts don't you know, do their job, it doesn't end there. We can still go back through the legislature and the amendment process and, and have, um, have a say because you know the courts are just a few people one person you know eight people whatever whoever's on the court if it's a supreme court nine whereas the the legislature brings back the the entirety of the people and the representatives so i, I just love that check and balance would you echo that i would actually agree with that? i actually wrote a constitutional amendment that was introduced into both houses of congress um it was called the repeal amendment and it basically empowered the state legislatures the super majority of state legislatures could repeal any federal law um, and it got introduced in the House and got introduced in the Senate. Then it didn't get anywhere after that. But I actually wrote an amendment that was introduced in the House. You can go online, you can Google the repeal amendment, and you can even see the press conference that was held in the uh, Senate gallery uh, when the senators and congressmen were announcing um, the amendment. And I was in the, the spectators group of the, of the gallery to watch my amendment get introduced into Congress. That is so cool. That is so cool. And what was it again before I go to Kathy? It, it was it's called, that it was called, said, it was was called it? the repeal amendment. So to, that to do what state, again? So, state, so the repeal amendment, so state legislatures could repeal a federal law if they wanted to. Great. Yeah, love that. Love that. I might have to bring that back. Okay, Kathy, go ahead. Well, thank you, Professor Barnett. We've got so many great audience questions and we want to try to get to a few of those. Uh, first of all, Marjorie Immer asked, if president declares state a state of emergency, can that waive our 14th Amendment rights? Um, well, typically, no. Um, the Supreme Court has said that emergency does not waive any of our constitutional rights. Um, what states of emergency tend to do, and usually governors are, are declaring states of emergency under their state uh, laws, uh, and then the president can do it for other purposes. They typically um, affect statutes. So they bring into effect certain governmental powers uh, that otherwise a governor would not have or otherwise the president would not have by statute. So the statutes say, if the governor declares a state of emergency, you will then be able to, they, the governor will be able to do X. A statute has given the government governor that opportunity, that power. The problem is, is that states of emergencies throughout history have been abused to the point, that's how we got Nazi Germany. We got Nazi Germany through states of emergencies that were declared uh, by the Weimar Republic. Um, and eventually it was a permanent state of emergency and then that was the end of everything else. So they're very, very dangerous. That's the reason why the court has said we don't really have any ex state of emergencies in the exception to constitutional rights. However, when an emergency does exist, that will affect the facts on which the legitimacy of a regulation will depend. Remember I told you that challenges to those restrictions on our liberty must be fact-based. And the fact of an actual emergency, a health crisis, for example, a pandemic, that can affect what reasonable restrictions on our, what restrictions on our liberty are in fact reasonable. It's not the declaration of an emergency that does it. It's the actual emergency that does it. Um, and so that's the way in which emergencies are relevant to what government may do are consistent with our rights. Because remember, the police power is there for government to protect our rights from other people. And so we, that's why government is supposed to be there. Great. 
Um, and then you had mentioned the Federalist Papers earlier, and Keith Hardeen writes, do the Federalist Papers have any authority in determining what the founders meant when interpreting the Constitution? They only have the authority of a teacher or somebody who was present at the founding and knew a lot about why things were done the way they were done. They don't have any technical authority. Um, and sometimes they're over relied on uh, because they were actually partisan polemics written by very thoughtful people, Alexander Hamilton, James Madison and John Jay to advocate for adopting the constitution. So they were one side of a political debate. They happen to be extremely well done which is why they've become classics but they have to be interpreted you know, with caution uh, because they're only one person's views of what the meaning of a particular text was. Primarily what they're important to is they provide a theory, not so much the meaning of the text, but a theory of why the text says what it does it, as explained by some of the architects of that text, primarily James Madison, because Alexander Hamilton didn't have that much to do with the construction of the text, but Madison did along with many others. Uh, and they're explaining the theory of, well, why did we do it this way? Uh, that's why it's, that's, that's the most important information it provides. Okay. And then uh, David Robs Robbins writes, does the Equal Protection Clause require states to treat individuals in the same class similarly, similarly? Does the state have the right to declare what private businesses are essential and non-essential? Um, well, actually, that was the subject of my con constitutional law rights uh, final exam um, in December. Um, and so I asked what I asked my law students to say, have them tell me. Um, it's, it, I, I, as I said to you before we did this, pro this podcast, I wasn't going to give specific constitutional opinions on the constitutionality of any given measure, be it mask mandates or now what's essential or what's not essential. My goal here is to explain to you the framework within which these decisions need to be made and evaluated by an independent judiciary. Okay. Um, I had a, a broader question that I'm still a little bit unclear on. Um, when they, when the 14th Amendment was passed, I, and when I was doing a little reading before this podcast, a lot of times you read that the purpose of the 14th Amendment was to apply the Bill of Rights to the states in sort of a shorthand description. But then in other places, I read that the courts really didn't fully interpret it that way until the 1940s. So, and the Bill of Rights is not exactly mentioned by name in the 14th Amendment. Um, so was it the intention with the passage of the 14th Amendment to apply all of the Bill of Rights to the states or is that something that has kind of happened piecemeal uh, as we have you know, progressed with court cases uh, you know, over the years? Well, the short and dirty answer is that both of those things are right. Yes, it was intended to do it and two, it actually happened piecemeal. Um, but it's not the actual, that is the short and dirty answer. The correct answer actually is that privileges or immunities refers to fundamental civil rights. And one of the sources of those fundamental civil rights are the rights that are in the constitution already. The other source of fundamental civil rights were the rights in the Civil Rights Act of 1866 that, uh, uh, that Tar I'm sorry, that uh, Tova already asked me about. So it wasn't limited to the Bill of Rights and it wasn't the Bill of Rights per se. It was whatever rights are fundamental to American citizenship. What rights are fundamental to American citizenship? Well, surely the rights in the first state amendments are. That's what Senator Jacob Howard said on the floor of Congress from Michigan when he introduced the amendment. He said, it's, it's the fundamental rights we have include, uh, plus the ones that are in the constitution. So the answer is yes. Those fundamental rights are included and also, yes, they've only been adopted piecemeal. Um, and the theory of incorporation per se, the, even the word incorporation is a theory that was devised in the 1940s. And it was devised as a way of limiting the 14th Amendment, not extending it, because it basically said, we're gonna limit the privileges or immunities or the 14th Amendment to the Bill of Rights. No other rights gonna get protected, only those rights. And that was clearly not what the amendment was supposed to protect. Okay, and that answered another question that I had as far as why would you not want the Bill of Rights to be applied to the states, but it sounds like that the answer would be because you don't want your rights to be limited to just what is in the Bill of Rights. 
Well, I think the answer is you do want them, but the reason why they made the they invented the cor incorporation doctrine was Justice Black who pushed for the incorporation doctrine, uh, Hugo Black, uh, is because he thought that he didn't want judges making up rights, he didn't want judges enforcing unenumerated rights, rights that were not listed, and so we, you can only enforce the ones that are in writing, and those are the only ones in writing, and so those are the only ones you can enforce. That is an overly restricted view of the Privileges or Immunities Clause of the 14th Amendment. Uh, but that is what, but on the other hand, at least it was something. It's better than nothing. Um, and so we've got half a loaf, and half a loaf is better than no loaf at all. One last little twist, as I mentioned at the beginning, if anybody is, was here at the beginning, those rights are enforced by means of the due process clause, not the privileges or immunities clause where they belong. So that's where the due process clause got expanded to make up for the missing due privileges or immunities clause. When they added, they added the bill of rights to the due process clause. Now there are conservatives who say that violates the original meaning of the due process clause and they're right, but it doesn't violate the original meaning of the privilege or immunities clause. And if you limited the due process clause to its original meaning and you don't bring back the privilege of immunities clause, now you've gutted the 14th Amendment. So you've got to do both. You can't just do one or the other. You're going to have original meaning. It's got to be a both provisions, not just due process. Okay. And then finally, uh, Robert Zimmerman asks, in the reading of the impeachment proceedings, they referred to the 14th Amendment. Can you explain this? Is there anything in the 14th Amendment that would have to yeah, do? Yeah, well, they're talking, they're talking about Section 3, which has to do with disqualification for political office of people who are guilty of insurrection, okay. who are, it was a reference to Southerners who are guilty of insurrection, taking up arms against the United States, the government of the United States. Um, that's what they're talking about. Okay. And then that actually brought to mind one other question that I had that uh, we haven't we didn't really go much into the other sections of the 14th Amendment in rightly, I mean, because there's so much in the first section for sure. But um, in section four, it talks about debt. And it, I think it originally referred to civil war debt. But in past few years, when uh, the president has wanted to raise the debt ceiling, some members of Congress have, have thought about uh, using the 14th Amendment as a defense not to. Um, or maybe that's backwards. Yeah, I think that's backwards. The, pre the president, I think with President Obama, he was encouraged to invoke the 14th Amendment because it says in the first uh, clause of the 14th Amendment in section four that you can't question the debt of the United States. And if members of Congress were opposing raising the debt ceiling, they would be questioning the debt. Well, I think that was spurious at the time it was made, but let me just say, uh, I just wrote a whole book on the 14th Amendment that was, that's going to be published. It only is about Section 1 and Section 5, which is Congress's power to enforce Section 1. It's not about Sections 2, 3, and 4. Um, and so I tend to avoid opining on uh, matters that I am not expert on, other than to sort of red flag what this is about. So I could tell you that's why they're talking about it in impeachment. I can't tell you whether they're correct to talk about it or not. I mean, I have to say I'm very skeptical of this impeachment charge. I think it's a little bit ridiculous, frankly. Um, but that's not what I'm here to talk about today. Okay. Okay. Well, we just okay, so we, I'm we, gonna toss it back to Janine. Okay. Okay. Well, I, we're wrapping up here and we have 60 seconds. I just, for our younger kids, we were tossing around a bunch of stuff in that last conversation before this one about privileges and immunities clauses. So for our middle school and you know, let's just wrap it up one more time for the middle school kids, you know, the younger the younger kids. Define in the closing closing comment here, privileges and immunity clauses. Once again, what is what 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 are like in sixty seconds? No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States. What are those privileges or immunities? We've already established they are they include the privileges the rights that are in the Civil Rights Act of 1866. They include the rights that are in the first eight amendments of the Constitution. Okay, that's the privilege immunities clause. You want me to do the other two clauses too? Go ahead. Yes. The due process of law clause says you have to have a judicial process before anybody can be uh, put to death, uh, put to sent to jail, or have their property taken. And that uh, process must include a judicial, uh, an impartial judicial evaluation of whether the statute that's being used to deprive you of life, liberty, or property is a constitutionally valid law within the power of either the federal government under the Fifth Amendment or the state governments under the Fourteenth Amendment to enact. But now I'm going to do the Equal Protection Clause. <laughs> Kids, 
can go back and play this in slow motion. I think we got it. basically says that governments need to protect you. They have an affirmative duty to protect you and your rights. They can't just sit back and let other people violate their your rights. And if they do, Congress can step in and pass a law to protect your rights when the states won't do so. You're brilliant. We love, we're always so lucky to have you grace us with your your knowledge and your your determination and your brilliance. So thank you so much. We're lucky to have you as a guest. And this was a fascinating. A and thank you. Well, fascinating is our favorite word around here. So it was truly an education. Buy the book so and get the video, you. buy the book and get the videos and you'll all be explained to you at much greater length and it'll be slower. That it won't, we don't talk so fast. <laughs> We don't talk so fast in our videos. And thank you to our sponsors again, uh, David and Danae Finstermaker. We really appreciate you sponsoring this episode. Thank you so much. Y'all have a great day. We'll see you next Tuesday.